Once again, we're going to be talking about cloudy with a chance of breaches, right? More and more. The cloud, let me start off by saying this. The cloud is a very, very scary topic to discuss. It is. I have been using AWS cloud for years. I have a huge fan of it. Like three, four years ago, I wrote a blog post kind of trying to introduce people to uh, to some of the nuances of it to help them feel like they can get started. And so, you know, you think like, oh, he's a veteran cloud user. He's this and that. But that's fairly small scale, right? It's AWS on a fairly small scale compared to the things that I never have to deal with that a large organization that uses AWS does. And even if someone that deals with a lot of that in a large organization with AWS, well, okay, but what about Azure, right? What about Google's cloud? Right? What about even all the digital ocean, all the other clouds out there? So, you know, when I listen to or talk with friends of mine like Dave or Moses or Kat that are just stone cold, true cloud experts, the imposter syndrome ramps all the way up to 11. It really does. So why am I taking a minute to talk about this stuff here today it is because it's important, right? More and more often when I'm called in to help out an organization, cloud has been a component for years, but more and more often cloud isn't the component, cloud is the focus, and so we're going to talk about things that I've seen within the past year. So who am I? I said I'm a, a principal SANS instructor now, 21 years, over 21 years of a government experience, founded multiple OSINT units, et cetera, et cetera. What is the agenda here today? And it's basically, for all intents and purposes, kind of broken up into three sections, right? Section number one, and it's so common when places get popped and they figure out like all of a sudden, okay, we got popped. There was something happened with our cloud resources. How did this happen? What creds were used to achieve this, right? So number one, how did these creds get exposed, right? Once you figure out what creds they are, how did these creds get exposed? Part two, what could the creds have done, right? This is very, very important for incident response, right? What did these creds try to do? What did they have success with? And what did they fail at? And then part three, can we take that information? This is where the OSINT starts to come in. Can we maybe get an idea of who this was, right? Trying to put a little bit of a, determine the trade craft that they're using and maybe try to identify who they are. So the situation made a website, right? Me and uh, my good friend, ChatGPT, made this beautiful, beautiful website right here. I was kind of surprised cloudosint.com is available, if I'm being honest. And the reason I was doing this is I wanted to set up the infrastructure to simulate these different attacks that I've seen, right? NDAs are in place. You don't want to mention specific clients, but everything in this talk is something that I have seen in the past year and some that I have seen literally this month, right? So I just kind of wanted to simulate some of that infrastructure for this talk. So we just made a there simple, vulnerable CMS content management system website. What is the situation? This is very, very common, right? Web admin calls, says the site is down. You check the S3 bucket hosting your static content, the pictures, the images for the site, et cetera, the resources, and discover the content is deleted except for a ransom note. This is unbelievably common. The infrastructure itself, like the serverless web app hosting, appears to be live and well, right? What do we do? Where do we start from here? And we're going to start off at a very, very good place, a diagram, right? And just kind of think about, as we're getting ready to look at how these threads could have leaked potentially, what does this ecosystem looks like? And if we start up here at the very top, we have the developers who are pushing their code to GitHub. GitHub is going down and you have this serverless app hosting. And we'll talk about that in a second. There's a lot of different ways that... Uh, a lot of different ways this can look like and this can appear, right? People use serverless for different things sometimes. So we have the serverless app hosting, excuse me. We have the content, the pictures, the images, the resources for our website in this S3 bucket. AWS has their infrastructure, right? DNS, certain things like that to point at our website. And then over here for the general users, they're just gonna be using www.cloudosent.com. And then we have cached and archived versions of the site. So with that diagram, now we'll look at the same diagram, but what are the most likely ways, right? Once again, creds got out. These creds were used to, in this case, delete, you know, maybe encrypt the resources in the bucket and leave a ransom note. What are the most likely ways that these creds could have escaped, right? Well, if we look at number one right there, the bucket was publicly writable, right? The bucket is designed to be publicly readable so people can load up the resources, but was it publicly writable, right? Could people make modifications to it? Number two, creds were exposed in GitHub. Very, very common, right? 
Number three, misconfiguration in the serverless infrastructure. We'll talk about that in a few slides. Number four, there was a vulnerability or exposed credentials on the live site, right? Number five, the creds have been leaked in a previous version of the site, right? Maybe the site is fine now, but maybe on archive.org or some of the other archive.ph sites, there is a version that has some sensitive information. And then number six, developer leaked creds or the developer machine compromised, right? We're seeing more and more of these um, these data stealer logs, right? These malware families. And years ago, if someone compromised 10,000 computers, they would look at it as like, oh, I have a botnet of 10,000 computers and I can perform denial of service attacks and do some other things. Now, right, that shifted. And they don't look at that as just, oh, 10,000 computers, like it's some arbitrary number and it's only meant for flooding others with traffic. Now they're thinking like, where do these people work? Right? Where do they have access to? Where do they bank? Right? How can we use them to pivot into other more valuable networks? And so if your developer gets compromised and all of a sudden these creds leak out, that is not good. So let's talk about ruling out the easy stuff. Right, We just laid out what are the most common ways. How can we actually rule these out to see how were these creds leaked out? Once again, that's very, very common. Places determine, okay, these are the creds. How were they leaked out? What do we need to clean up? How are they out there? We can roll them right now, but we need to know how they were actually obtained in the first place for if it's something we need to fix or not. First things first, just check the cloud configuration, right? We can just check to see, is this bucket publicly writable? You see the access uh, rules right there and it's, you know, list bucket, but it shouldn't be able to write to it. And a very, very kind of quick, easy way to test this is you see right here, just frankly try to push a file to it, right? If you're doing incident response, if you're doing this, make sure that people know you're trying to push a file to it. So if you have a certain thing that you want to name it, you see there forensics test file dot txt, right? Something that doesn't cause someone to freak out or deal with that or think that this uh, compromise is still going on. But just a quick, simple way to check, is this bucket world writable? Were the creds exposed in GitHub, right? This is once again, a very, very common one. We can download the code into a zip file and then use a tool like Trufflehog to scan through that code and look for secrets, right? And Trufflehog, once again, is a tool designed to scan through and look for sensitive secret information. Now, we can download the code in a zip file or we can just sick Trufflehog right here at the repository. Doing it that way, sicking Trufflehog on the repository instead of downloading the code, and if all you have is a downloaded copy of the code, it is what it is, right? Trufflehog can still work. Ideally, you want to be able to sick it live at the repository because as you see right here, if we had just downloaded the code, Trufflehog actually wouldn't have found this. But in this case, Trufflehog found, you see there, the AWS access key that we have this block around, this red block right there. And why is that significant? Why wouldn't it have found it if we had downloaded the code? Because that wasn't currently in the code. That was on an old working branch of the code that was buried in the commit history, and it had since been removed. And so if we had downloaded the code, wouldn't have found it. But since we were able to give Troublehog access and scan the repository, it was able to find these old commit histories that, like I said, wasn't currently in the code, but there's the secret right there. This is kind of cool too. Trufflehog identified this secret, that AKIA, AWS access key, but then it automatically took that and went out and checked with Amazon and it found the Amazon, you see there, the ARN, the Amazon resource number. It identified the email address that pushed the commit. It identified what commit it actually was. So once it found the secret, it didn't just print the secret. It actually tried to gather up information about how this actually happened, where this took place, right? And what user actually made this commit. Very, very cool. And once again, all too common to see. Obvious vulnerabilities or misconfiguration in app hosting, right? I said earlier in kind of the diagram, serverless. People use serverless in a lot of different ways. I hear serverless and I think like Lambda functions, right? I think serverless, but a lot of people refer to, you know, kind of Kubernetes clusters, kind of containers as serverless. I, I get it, right? I'm not here to argue that point, but the thing is, down in that container, if we have an operating system down there, that might be another place that we can once again scan for malware, right? You see there are some of the cloud components. AWS makes these on-demand malware scans. You might have other 
products that we can use that we can put on those at that point it's almost like a little end point right if we have the operating system down there that might be another place that we want to scan we can perform an external vuln scan right if you have something like a qualis that might be a very very good thing to kind of point at it and see here we're looking at a uh, one of the uh, SAS probably right there with a little free trial that makes it easy to kind of point at this and identify vulnerabilities or frankly right if you just have like OWASP zap for no budget or burp suite which I think my burp suite I think I pay about four hundred dollars a year for burp suite pro we can just run this scanner and start to look for vulnerabilities and this is once again very very common right I can remember a, a not that long ago dealing with an organization and someone came to them looking for money so they found a vulnerability on the website and they were almost like a blackmail at this point kind of big bounties what we jokingly refer to it as they were looking for money and in this case it's like okay we can start dealing with this and we did but also whoever your i told them whoever your best web app person is i would have them look at that site because this is probably legitimate there's probably something there and I can run a scan at it, but if you have someone that's really, really good and you want to sick them on it, go for it, right? But once again, just due diligence kind of scanning to making sure there's not some vulnerability there that we can find that was taken advantage of. Because if there is, even if we roll those creds, if they just get the new creds because the vulnerability is still existing, that's not a good thing, right? We haven't dealt with the root cause. GitHub dependency scan. This is fantastic, right? GitHub has that dependabot that will track dependencies in your repo and it gets you alerts. I, every time I get a dependabot, I'm like, oh, that's really, really kind of cool. This is also a slide to point out something very, very useful, right? You see their dependabot once again, it's looking at your code. It's looking at the dependencies and analyzing, oh, there's a dependency right here that actually has a vulnerability. So you should update this to go grab the new version. That's fantastic. Where are those alerts getting sent to, right? And this isn't just depend about, this is just kind of across the board. Turn on your alerting and make sure the alerts are going in the right place. Not that long ago, I was working with an organization, got compromised, and something at one point was like, you should have been alerted to this, right? We should have been alerted to this. Why weren't we alerted to this? And when they ran it down, the alert actually did fire it fired to an employee that no longer worked for that organization, right? And so once again, not only that alerting is on, but where it's actually firing those alerts to, very, very important. Checking the live rendered sites for secrets, right? And we just looked at the code. We just, you know, sick GitHub on, <clears throat> excuse me, Truffle Hog on the code to look at it in the repository so why would we want to bother checking the live site, right? And you see here, we're using something called HTT track. It's an oldie, but a goodie. It is fantastic at grabbing a copy recursively going through and basically cloning a website on your system. And the reason is, this is something I talk about in my uh, Sans OSINT class. <clears throat> Years ago, if you saw words on a web page, you could right click, view the source, do a control F and find those words. That is not always the case anymore, right? So much content is loaded up dynamically. For even just a very, very simple example here, you see this. If we look here, the user details, username, admin, the password 123. If we view the source code right here and start to go down, that login and password is not anywhere in the source code. Right? This is actually a function that's pulling it dynamically. And so once again, analyzing the code, we may not see it, but actually grabbing a copy of the website and then once again, doing truffle hog, grep, whatever it is you want to do, kind of scanning for secrets, unbelievably useful, right? And HT track is fantastic at this and it is 100% free, right? No reason you, uh, you shouldn't be using that. I use it all the time for archiving copies of sites. If for some reason you don't want to use HTT track, you can just use wget, right? Not the uh, kind of PowerShell alias version, but the Linux built-in version. You see there, you can do some very, very cool things with long wget commands. In this case, we're recursively grabbing everything off a site, right? Grabbing all the way down, making sure things are named appropriately, trying to grab the resources, saving it all into a directory. But usually, honestly, I'm just using HTT track. All right, those are kind of some of the um, the simple things to look for, right, of how these creds got exposed. Now, 
the first part and the last part I'm often involved with. This part, the middle part, I'm not involved with as much, right? And this is more of a uh, incident response. We have these creds identified now. Now we're in a phase two of where did these actually go, right? What could these have done? How bad is this? What do we need to contain? So what we're going to talk about in this section, right, we're going to test these creds or use Access Analyzer to figure out the scope. We're going to look at logs, run cloud auditing tools, try to grab some information that we can use in the last section, the OSINT section, to try to help us determine tradecraft, what tools they're using, maybe even attribution if we're lucky. And then after remediation, conducting additional checks and deeper dives to make sure the secrets are eliminated. So here we have AWS Access Advisor, right? And here we can look at some creds and see, right, what permissions they have and when these services were last used. So you see there when the screenshot was taken, all of the different things that they tried to access and last access today. So Access Analyzer can be very, very helpful to help us determine what permissions this account basically that Secret is tied to has, right? An Access Analyzer can tell you when a policy or resource allows access to that resource outside of your zone. So Access Advisor shows us what they could do. Access Analyzer analyzes our resources, like for instance, our buckets and says, hey, just so you know, you have this resource that is available to people outside of your zone, right? Outside of your little group right there. Maybe that's okay. A lot of times that's a, uh, that's a false positive when something like a bucket is designed to be world readable, but still this is very, very useful. AWS CloudTrail, right? This is the uh, the common logging that you hear, AWS. And we can look through here. There's a few things to talk about right here. Number one, these are incredibly useful, right? And you can see some of the data right there. See the username, what events they try to do, the list buckets, request certificates. And we can export these logs in CSV and JSON. And CSV is nice. CSV is easy to work with. But CSV doesn't have as much data as the JSON does. The JSON has the full error messages. And those are unbelievably handy, right? They are not only for uh, determining what happened necessarily, but especially when we try to uh, start getting into attribution, right? Successes are fantastic for incident response, right? It helps us determine where we need to go, what we need to do. Failures can be very, very useful for tradecraft, for attribution, right? And so that's why hopefully we have the JSON so we can see the error message data as well. And a big thing right here, this is not retroactive, right? This is coming down to something we're going to talk about on the very last slide of this. We need to do these things in advance, right? We can't just like, oh, this happened. Let me go turn this on and see what happened. Kind of needed to turn it on in advance, and we kind of needed to turn it on in that region, particularly, right? The um, This is one of those things a lot of organizations have logging on across all regions, even if they're not using those regions, right? That's It sounds dumb, but number one, when you're paying for like volume, well, there shouldn't be any volume there. And number two, if something does happen, as you see these attackers start to probe different regions to see what they can get away with, you'll be very, very glad you have these logs turned on everywhere that you can. When it goes to querying these AWS logs, right, CloudTrail can be enabled across all regions. That's great. But if you're in the event history GUI, it's showing you results for whatever region you're currently in. Here, we run dozens, dozens of these different API calls to test things from preparing this talk. But since currently I'm in the Stockholm region, it's only showing me 11 events, right? So this can just be one of those things, a little rabbit hole avoidance to avoid this gotcha of, oh, this is what I'm seeing. Well, nope, in that region, right? But what about what they tried to do in other regions? So just to be aware of. And another way to see this data that we can easily go across all regions is you see here the AWS CloudTrail link. So it goes to kind of a, um, you're almost writing like a SQL query to try to get the data, which... It isn't necessarily my favorite, but it works good. You have a little bit more limited export options. And what you can do, you can copy things, but you can just send things to an S3 bucket. So a best practice that I've seen in a few different organizations is they basically have these S3 buckets that are set up for incident response, that are set up for forensics, that automatically feed into Splunk, Elastic, whatever they're using. And then if an incident responder, someone is dealing with this, they can just 
send things to that bucket and know it'll be automatically ingested into the system so they can go run the queries and do what they're used to doing. So that's one way that a lot of people use as kind of like a best practice for this. And AWS Detective, right? And if you hear AWS Detective, you see there it automatically collects cloud trail, you know, VPC flow logs, guard duty findings. And it tries to basically identify trends, right? So think of like trends if you're thinking of AWS Detective. And we can see there the different service names that have been tried, right? Newly observed API calls. So there we see three people, or excuse me, three different counts of someone trying stop logging and delete detector. So actually trying to turn off security, right? The equivalent of someone taking hold of a system and trying to shut off antivirus, shut off the logging right there. Thankfully, we see a success rate of zero, right? That's a good thing, but we're starting to see these newly observed API calls, API calls that you don't normally see. And you can see how valuable that can be, right? Is detective helping you churn through a bunch of noise to try to find that needle in a haystack. And another detective slide right here, you see API calls with increased volume, right? So create user, very, very common for an attacker to try to do, get user, list hosted zones, et cetera, the giant rate increase above the norm. Internal call count, external call count is basically uh, the networking range that this came from. Was it internal or was it external? All right, so we've gone through the... How did these creds get exposed? We've gone through what these creds could have done potentially or what they did do in this case. And now once again, I'm commonly called in in the first part for finding out, hey, where do these creds leak out? Can we find that? And then this part right here, right? Now that we have this information from these creds, from these logs, what can we do to try to gather a better picture of what's going on right here? The OSINT part. So we're going to look a little bit more about guard duty and detective, right, to see what value we can get out of that. Same with the cloud trail logs, and then look at other artifacts that the attacker may have left behind there. AWS detective, right, another thing that it can show us that's very useful is newly observed geolocations, right? Do you have, you know, if all your developers are located in one part of the world and now you have activity coming from another part of the world, that is something to look into. This can also be incredibly useful for finding outliers, right? If you see right there, we see Tucson, we see Stockholm, we see, believe it or not, this, uh, you see there, the 59.318.1, that's actually off a plane. It's on a uh, plane during a flight. And then you have this one outlier, Las Vegas, right? The Las Vegas, and we'll see there later on. And what this was, was the attacker tried to do something when the VPN was disconnected, right? Didn't have the kill switch enabled, just one of these little things, right? But we only need the attacker sometimes to slip up once. If we catch that and detect that, we're off and running, we're in great shape. So we can query by user, we can query overall for new geolocations. We've got these different things that we can do. What do the logs tell us, right? From looking at the logs in this case, the attacker attempted to list users, create users, turn off guard duty, stop cloud trail logging, kind of normal things we would expect an attacker to do. And then the attacker tried to do some things that are very, very scary, right? Sending SES mail. Right? Imagine that, right? An attacker getting in there in a foothold and now being able to send mail on behalf of your organization. All right, that can go south very, very quickly. Issue a cert via certificate manager. Modify a DNS record, right? These are terrifying, terrifying things that the attacker tried to do, right? And we don't always think necessarily of an attacker trying to do these things, but these things are all extremely terrifying, the ramifications of what could, if these had actually worked, right? And then enumerate S3 buckets and test uploading a file, obviously. And you see there, we start to get our first clue or first indicator of who this person might be. You see, they're right, testing by Vlodia, boss of bug bounties. Humans like to brag, right? Humans like to prove to their friends. Humans, a lot of times, kind of like to show off, depending on what type of person it is, right? Nation state, low and slow, no. But script kitties, yeah, you can see this type of stuff. And even if it's not necessarily a script kitty, if it's someone that's just using a tool that they downloaded, this tool is going to have some defaults that we can use to get a lot of useful information, potentially. 
Here, looking at the JSON structure of an AWS event, we see this was failure, right? The error code access denied, so it didn't work, but there is a lot of useful information here, right? We have the access key ID up there at the top, the AKA number. We have the source IP address. We have the user agent, right? So whenever you see BOTO3, that's basically, it's a Python being used to access the AWS cloud, right? You'll see CLI, their command line interface for using just the built-in command line tool that you can download. And then you see BOTO3, which is basically calling it from Python code. So this is Python script, not something they were trying to do from a web page, right? Not something they were trying to do from the command line interface. And we got access denied. And what they were trying to do was create a user. You see the create user action right there. And they tried to create a user called bug bounty boss. I just dealt with this within the past three weeks, right? It was trying to help out an organization, look through, saw that they tried to create some, uh, some resources, right? Some users with certain names, took those names and within like 20 minutes had the developers GitHub, right? Was looking at their Telegram channel and getting a very, very good idea of who this tool was, who was using it and what the capabilities of the tool were all from looking at the failures and what they were trying to accomplish for these unique signatures, right? They don't bother to change these in the tools that they're using. And you can very, very track that back quickly to get an idea once again of the capabilities and some more information around them. User agents are unbelievably useful, right? In this case is no different. We see they're looking at the different user agents. We have the AWS CLI, so the command line interface. We have Python. Right, we have a custom one right there, right? But they have Python. Interesting, right? A custom value. They can put that in like their tool, their Python script, change the user agent string. A lot of people don't, but some do. And then we just have a web browser. Once again, this is very, very useful for looking at variations from the norm, right? Do your developers usually use one of these types of things, two of these types of things? And now you're seeing activity from something else that may be worth looking at, right? And these, once again, are all clues we're gathering up this information, trying to find out more about what tools they're using and potentially even maybe who they are. IP and user agent OSINT, right? We see here, we have a bunch of the exact same IP address from a Python script. You see the, the BOTO3 Python. And then all of a sudden, right? Like that little game we've been playing since we were little kids watching Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the other. We have an IP address that's different. And instead of Python script, it's AWS CLI. Okay? And this, in this case, what we're doing here is we're simulating the attacker tried to run a command. Didn't work, it failed. Then they're like, oh, okay, let me fire up my VPN. Let me try this automation script. But they weren't thinking, right? That command gave it away. Maybe they didn't have the, once again, the VPN kill switch and the VPN just dropped connection for a little bit, right? But you see these things, right? We look the same way in the OSINT class. We talk about historic who is, right? Where you see a domain that for a decade is private. And then you have like this four-day window when the historic who is data gives away who it is because they were transferring hosts, their credit card expired, right? the privacy went off, whatever it is. And it's that same type of concept here. You see consistently IP addresses that we can tie back to maybe a VPN provider or some region of the cloud, something, some compromised system but then one or two little blips that give away the true IP address of where the attacker is coming from. And now that we start to see, right, we had that username bug bounty boss, we can take that and look for where is that a username, right? We can use these sites like name check, like what's my name dot app to try to find out where this username is in use across the internet. We can search GitHub, right? We can just do general Google searches, right? all that type of information, try to find out more about, in this case, Bug Bounty Boss. And something that I was doing about three weeks ago, right, the name that once again, a name that I tried to make in the toolkit, searching that, and once again, finding them, their Telegram channel, right, through these kind of OSINT techniques, finding their GitHub repository and gathering up as much information as we can. And in that case, Bug Bounty Boss has a GitHub profile. Unfortunately, there aren't any public repositories. So it seems like it's not that good for us, but it actually is. Number one, if you look, we see the username for their GitHub, right? Bug Bounty Boss up at number one. But if you look at number two, 
we see they have a different username on Twitter. And this is very, very common, right? You have a username in one place, you try to go someplace else and that username is taken. So you have to switch to something else or some variation of it. So we do have a Twitter handle with another profile that we can go look at. And if we look at that, number one, I just want to call your attention to this amazing picture. This is actually made with Mid Journey. And I said, I want you to make me a picture of knockoff Star Wars figures that I would find at a flea market. And Mid Journey did so much better than I would ever expect. So I want to know, right? Questions, whatever, those are fine and great. What I want to know from you is what you like more, because I am torn between brown Darth Vader or the R2-D2 with legs. I think I'm kind of leaning R2-D2 with legs, but yeah, that's uh, this is tough to choose, right? This is tough to choose. But we're looking at this Twitter account now, the Bug Bounty Boss, you see Valdoya M, right? Just a Mondo looking for pay, bugbountyboss at gmail.com. And so now we have an email address, right? We're gathering up these selectors. We had a couple of usernames. We have a profile pic that at first looks like Boba, that's actually Russian, right? A little bit in there. So kind of a, uh, a little bit more unique of a profile pick than we would necessarily assume. But we're gathering up all of these information now. We now have multiple selectors, both images, email address, and usernames that we can start to use to identify them elsewhere. And if we look at the Twitter profile for this bug bounty boss, there was a public repo at one point. It's unfortunately just not public any longer. So it was public at one point, unfortunately not any longer, but we have archive sites, right? So we have the URL, we go over and we go to archive.org, right? Everyone's favorite site right there. And we look and we can actually find a historic copy of, you can see there, his new AWS recon script, right? That we saw on the last slide. We can look at the code, we can see the capabilities, and now we have potentially at least the toolkit that the hacker was using. And maybe we have the hacker itself, right? With what they're leaving behind, other indications that maybe this was them, but really kind of completing out a picture to better understand what happened in this incident. Like I said, more and more often now, it, cloud has been a component. And someone's calling me to help out with something. Cloud has been a component of that for a long time. But more and more often now, like I said, cloud is not a component. Cloud is like central to it. And usually it's a, here are the creds, we're dealing with it. How do these creds get out? How do they get it? And who did it? That's what we're trying to answer. And these are some of the techniques that once again, I've had success with over the past year doing this across several real world examples. Another thing we can do, right, is once again, evidence that they leave behind, artifacts that they leave behind. In this case, they left behind this hack by Vodoya Bug Boss with another uh, mid-journey classic right there, of like old Westy Sheriff Boba Fett. But this can be very, very useful, right? Whatever the signature is, we can take that, we can go to urlscan.io, and we can take part of that URL, right? And we can start looking at that and start finding that. And that's a very, very useful technique, right? It's a, um, my wife is in this industry too. And one thing I know she's done several times is basically someone will do something for her organization or she'll detect an attack gearing up against her organization. She'll take some unique part of that, go to URL scan and find out they're also gearing up attack against four other organizations and she can notify them. So that URL scan, being able to search for artifacts for unique things and parts of URL to determine other things that the attacker is doing can be unbelievably useful. And this, once again, it sounds silly, but as we get more and more things that we can tie to the attacker, once again, we only need them necessarily to mess up once, right? We need to give them, get them to send up sensitive information one time, right? And kind of release that. And then we're off and running. And so that's why it's so important, just like with a uh, bug bounty hunting, right? We're enumerating as much attack surface as we possibly can to start looking for vulnerabilities. Here, we're trying to tie as many things as we can to this attacker. And so now that we can start maybe trying to find out, oh, yep, they slipped up here. They did this. They slipped up here. It's like the same thing we talk about with the dark web, right? It's, um, you know, ooh, the dark web and the technology and everything else. Yeah, but when people are giving away their usernames, sometimes email addresses, right? Like, oh, yeah, you hit me up here on Jabber, right? That information that we can take, bring down to the internet, 
and now use all of our OSINT techniques to bear, our historical who is, our breach data, everything that we can bring to try to bring some attribution to this case. And the next last slide here, right before we wrap this up, I think I'm about out of uh, time here anyway, is, you know, make your IR teams life easier with this one weird trick. There's a few, a uh, few weird tricks in there. I, I think some of the biggest ones though, right? You see there, configure CloudTrail logging appropriate for your apps, right? Not retroactive, do it in advance. But in general, that do in advance, you see there, threat model with dev teams, when you're doing incident response, that's not the time to make the diagram, ideally not in advance. And so many times I'm working with organizations and you're talking with them and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, we can answer that question. And then they come back later and never mind, we can't. Right? We thought we could answer that question. Actually turns out we can't, right? We don't have that capability. We don't have that connection to connect data point A to connect to point D, whatever it is. And so going through, right? Doing tabletop exercises, right? Doing threat modelings, working through and testing this. Can we answer this question? Can we figure that out? How long does it take us? Can we contain this? Can we isolate this? Same type of thing with instant response, right? Tabletopping this out, doing this threat modeling in advance, figuring out so when the time comes, it's still going to be painful, but it's going to be a heck of a lot less painful than if we weren't prepared for this. So, Normally, I think I, like I said, used about all of my time. My DMs are wide open on Twitter. You see my email right there, matt on argaliuslabs.com, matt0177 Gmail will get to me too. If you have any questions, anything like that, please let me know. I don't know why. Thank you for your time. Hope you enjoyed it. And I look forward to talking to some of you. Thank you.